The following program is brought to you by Element 14, the electronics community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com slash presents. Welcome back to Element 14 Presents. I'm Clem and today we will build a portable Sega Genesis without wasting any precious vintage hardware. We will use this fake knockoff console that takes real cartridges to build it. Let's get started. Amazing hacks. Inspired designs. Each week, Element 14 Presents brings you innovative projects using electronics, engineering, and more. Everybody likes vintage gaming, but nobody likes to destroy a working console. There are only a few of them left. So these Chinese knockoffs come in handy. They are basically like Nintendo on a chip, but for Sega. The 368 games in one are truly a lie and it also doesn't have a real software library as stated on the box. Let's take a look at it, tear it down and see what we can build with it. So we have the contents of the box and this is possibly the lightest console I have ever witnessed. It's barely anything in there. And it's also the lightest power plug ever and it has the most obvious catastrophic design failure ever. This doesn't fit in any plug in the world. It's like they had a picture of a European power plug and just never seen a real one. So that won't fit in any power socket. Completely useless. Also the controller feels absolutely terrible. Completely mushy D-pad. It's a lot smaller than our original Sega Genesis controller. Yeah, it's terrible. So let's make this terrible machine in something that's actually enjoyable and useful. On the first look after opening it, it's obvious why it's so light, there's barely anything in there. It basically works the same as Nintendo on a chip, it's just a Mega Drive on a chip. A dedicated ASIC that was glob topped to the PCB. And it's conveniently labeled for the audio video and power inputs, so we can assume that pinout. And the rest of that is basically trial and error to find out the correct pinout. So I spent a few hours on figuring that out, how this thing works, how everything is connected and make a schematic. You could call that reverse engineering, but it's actually just following the traces on the PCB and referencing these traces to the pinout of the controller inputs. These are exactly the same ones as on an original Sega Genesis, but I had to confirm that first by referencing the joypad PCB to these pins and turns out they are basically an exact clone. They also have six buttons, so the working mechanism for the six alternative buttons is also the same on an original. If you want to use only three of these buttons, it's very straightforward to wire that in. But of course I want to have all six buttons, so I had to do a little bit more trial and error referencing and pinging everything with my Klein multimeter to make sure I got the correct pinout. I want to keep two player functionality, so there will be a DB9 port on the finished unit that allows me to plug in a secondary Genesis controller and play with two players. So I had also to reference these pinouts to the main PCB. Keep in mind, if you do such things, pinouts may be scrambled in weird ways, which they are on this unit. So don't assume that it's the same pinout on this unit than the fake knockoff you may get. They can be vastly different. Before I take everything apart, I had to verify that it works in the first place, so I hooked it up to a tiny TV. And no picture, but the sound is working, so I know that the unit has booted up. Instead of switching out screens until I find one that works, I used my oscilloscope to verify that there is a composite signal at all. So yes, turns out there is a composite signal. I use a tiny rear view monitor, as the screen for my finished device, so I hooked that up to the fake Sega Genesis and turns out that one worked perfectly. So I have a screen for the project, I know the unit works, let's disassemble it and see what makes it tick. After verifying the pinout, I took apart the three boards of the original device and also cut up the controller. I also referenced with photos and some markings which trace belongs to which button. 
and I also added ground wires to that. So when I solder it up, I will know which button corresponds to which pin. So when I have the finished unit built, all the buttons will be at the correct spots and will work as intended. It's pretty simple to cut up these boards, just use an X-Acto blade, score it, snap it, and then use that blade again to expose some copper on the traces. I always like to stagger them, so the risk of having a contact with the solder blobs that I will attach when soldering is minimized. If you are using Genesis-like hardware to build a controller, it's crucial to don't mix up all these pads because there is a select sequence that puts the controller in different modes to engage different buttons. So if you mix that up, your controller might not work as intended or might not work at all. I'm Karen Corbeil, host of The Learning Circuit, a show where we learn about electronic components and concepts, then apply what we learn by building projects. Look for new episodes of The Learning Circuit on Wednesdays and connect with me on the Element 14 community on element14.com forward slash the learning circuit. Happy learning. While I think about how to connect everything in that device, I'm drawing up a design in Fusion 360 for the case to make sure everything fits. So I drew representations of the screen, the main board, and some other components so I know everything will fit inside the case. I gave some extra wiggle room for the cables. There will be a lot of cables in there to make sure I won't run out of space when I put all the parts together. The unit has a sandwich construction. There's a front plate, a rim, a back plate, and there's a little back piece that covers the cartridge slot. I want the cartridge to be flat against the back of the unit and not stick up in any weird position. So the width of the main board plus the thickness of the screen dictates how big the unit will be. I designed the unit in a landscape orientation to make it look like a Game Gear or the Sega Nomad. And also because of the big screen, I thought it would be a bit awkward to hold or to transport it if it would look like a Game Boy. While doing the pinout, I also verified that the unit will run on 5 volts. But turns out the screen is not properly working at the same 5 volts. It needs at least 6 volts, 6.5 volts to display a very clean picture. So what I do is I will add another boost circuit to my Adafruit PowerBoost 1000 that is used to charge and connect a LiPo battery. So the Adafruit module will pump that up 3.7 volts from the LiPo battery to 5 volts and then another module will pump it out to 8.5 volts. With the voltage drop in the system, this should even out at about 6.5 volts. The Genesis can actually withstand up to 10 volts and the screen should be fine with 12 volts. So no issues there. I had to give a little bit of margin to compensate for the voltage drop. For the controls, I used the original PCB of the controller, cut it up, soldered some wires to the exposed pads and used some protoboard to build up new controls. Of course, I used some push-button switches to give it a tactile feel and because these are the easiest to work with. And to make the functional buttons that you're actually touching, I used my resin 3D printer, unfortunately not my big one, just the standard one, to make these buttons 3D printed with some clear blue resin. While 3D printing and laser cutting all my design files, I started on wiring up all the circuitry and I also confirmed after every step that the unit is still working. The power switch for the system is wired in a strange way. There is a transistor on the board I couldn't find any datasheet for and some caps. So I recreated the same circuit that is on the circuit board directly on the main board by soldering the components directly to it. I used the original transistor, but I changed the caps for fresh high quality ones. On the first try, it didn't want to boot, but then I discovered that I have mixed up two pads and when I corrected my mistake, everything booted up fine. I'm 3D printing and lasering all the parts that I designed. 
Make sure you download these files if you want to recreate that system at element14.com forward slash present. You can also find my pinout for this unit there. Uh, keep in mind that if you buy any fake knockoff consoles, they might be completely different from this one. So it's basically trial and error, but this may give you some help if you want to get started. On the top of the unit, there is an additional DB9 port for the second player. Composite video out, audio out, the power switch and the charging port for USB micro. Design wise, I wanted it to look like it was a, a Sega device, so it's glossy black, glittery gray, and also has some translucent blue buttons that remind me of the Sonic Blue. When putting all these parts together, I was very happy that I left enough room for all the cables. There are a lot of them in there. And now it's time for a test drive. This device is not region locked, so you could play Genesis games from the US, Mega Drive games from Europe or Japan, and they should just work. Let's give it a test run. I don't happen to have any real Genesis games here, so we will stick to the inbuilt game. The box said 368 in one, uh, but turns out there are actually only four. Let's start with Sonic the Hedgehog. This one does work better than I was used to on my original Mega Drive back in the day because this runs on 60 Hz like the American Genesis and my Sega Mega Drive in Europe ran at 50 Hz. So Sonic actually runs faster in America. This one emulates the 60 Hz variant, so that's more fluid and uh, more speedy than I'm used to. The buttons feel great, much better than the original D-pad. And it's very fun, of course, it's Sonic. something very European. It's World Cup 92 by Tecmo. Uh, that's a soccer or football game, as we like to call it. And this one is pretty special. First, because there was no World Cup in 92. There was 90 in Italy and 94 in America. There is no 92 World Cup. So that's one strange thing. The next one is that some of these countries are written in English and Germany is written in German. There it is, Deutschland. Even stranger, there is Soviet Russia, which was already defunct in 92. There's Yugoslavia, which also was already gone in 92. And Argentina and Peru have flags they actually never had. So that's a really weird one. Despite these quirks, uh, the game is actually pretty fun. I have never enjoyed any football game on the Sega. I had some weird one that you had to look up from top of the players that was pretty much unplayable. This one actually is a lot of fun. My portable Mega Drive turned out pretty slick. It plays games from America, Europe, Japan. So I will take this with me on conventions or at the flea market to try out games before I buy them to make sure they work. Especially useful for expensive ones. What would you build with fake knockoff stuff? Something like this? Something totally different? Let us know in the Element 14 community. I gotta go, there's another project waiting for me. Yeah.